What I've done is I have split that note in two simply because of new items that the Lord has shown me just in this week. So I started to formulate the note and then I discovered this is going to be too long a note to serve as a note. So I've split it up into two. I sent the first part, I think, on the WhatsApp group to you. And I will share the subsequent part maybe later tomorrow with you. But remember, we're dealing with the subject of repentance, which is a change of mind or change of mindset regarding sin, error, or embarking upon a path that is displeasing to God, but you adjust your mind, you adjust your mentality, you acknowledge your sin, you confess the sin, you forsake the sin, you have no intent of going back to that sin. And in last session, we discussed the whole issue of restitution. And we said that restitution involves paying back something unlawfully gotten or setting any wrong previously done right. It's making the crooked paths straight, right? It is very important that that process takes place simply because it gives evidence of a transformed life. So he who does not have out or external outward signs of inward repentance, for me, he hasn't truly repented. Even John said, bring forth meat for repentance, King James, or bring forth evidence for repentance. So that you repented must be evidenced by a transformed lifestyle. I am past people saying things. I want to see your life change. I'm past people saying things with their words. We are great espousers, but we are poor practitioners. The evidence of a recommitment is evidenced by lifestyle change, okay? And your lifestyle has got to change if you have claimed that you indeed have repented from your sin. Restitution is to put back that which was done wrong, even though God has forgiven you of the sin. But there's some practical things you do to evidence that. And so we spoke uh, preeminently uh, in, on Wednesday about Acts 3 from 19 to 20 that says repent, return, or turn, and be converted that your sins might be blotted out so that times of refreshing can come from the presence of the Lord. So I, I shared with you a WhatsApp group, uh, a WhatsApp note on the group in the week where you'll see those three phrases, repent, return, refresh. Say it with me. Say repent. repent. Say return. return. Say refresh. refresh. Right? So it's, uh, it's, it's repent and turn or just your life. Right? So that times of refreshing can come from the presence of the Lord. The next two verses state that Jesus is retained in the heavens until the times of rester. Restitution and restitution there involves bringing things back to biblical order or bringing things back to original design. Things must get back to order. So when you restitute as evidence of your repentance, you do something external to evidence the fact of a, of a changed heart. We sang a song now, Change My Heart, O God. It's fine to sing it and experience it, but it's demonstrated by an external change of your, of your behavior. So we saw, for example, that uh, times of refreshing, according to the Greek word anopuxis, literally means a refreshment or being cool, and the implication is to breathe again. It's like to get a, a second breath, okay? It's like God gives you a fresh wind, a fresh start, a reinvigoration to continue the course upon His purpose. Where does this come from? Times, everyone say times. Kairoi, foreordained, foreordained things in time past that must happen within your experience. A Kairos time is an opportune time, we said. It's an appropriate time in which certain foreordained events in God's calendar must take place in your experience. Okay? Now, God has got plans for you. God has plans for all of us. God has great purposes for all of us. Amen? God has destiny for all of you. Aspects and significant aspects of the destiny will break forth. I said this to you with this gesture on Wednesday. It's like pockets, moments, significant doings 
of the Lord in Kronos, in time, but when you are in Kronos, in actual time, but living in Kairos as your spatial sphere of existence or your primary mindset, then what you bring to bear upon your earthly time is a heavenly time dimension. So the scripture says Christ died in due time. Right? He came on the earth in a specific Kronos, but that the timing was of the Lord. It was, it was spot on. Right? But it had to manifest in that epoch of time, in that dimension of time. Right? Now, I'm trusting God for yours and my life that what breaks forth upon us is momentous occasions, epoch-making periods, from which, and we said the, the, the Greek scholar West, he defined kairoi as epoch-making periods, dates or moments from which successive events are numbered or so significant by their stature that whatever happens futuristically is referenced from that point. That's epochal. That's epoch-making. That is extremely significant, okay? Now, I want to encourage you, those kairois, when you experience it, no man can take that away from you. When it's your time, it is your time. No devil in hell can oppose you. No human agency can withstand you. When God decides in Kronos, I'm going to do something significant in your, in your time, there's nothing on the earth that can withstand the force of what God wants to do simply because it's a Kairos moment. Everyone say Kairos. It's a Kairos moment. Jesus had to be born and to be born successfully. No Herod from hell will, will be successful in his attempts to kill the baby. When Moses was born, no Pharaoh edict or Pharaohic edict will kill the child. Why? It is so significant that those things transpire in their time because it's going to set the way the rest of history will, will, will take form and shape from that moment in time. Now please hear, come on, hear what I'm saying in the spirit. I'm saying to you, there are epoch-making occasions that God wants to do in you. Amen. Right? It's called a time, a kairoi of refreshing. But when it comes, it's going to cause you to breathe again. It's going to say, oh, you know, it's like, you, it's like when God does something, it's like he breathes into you and you get new vigor, you get new zest, new va va yep. new zeal. And you say, I can go on now. Based upon this significant doing of the Lord. Do you know what Mary said when she realized she's having the Christ child inside a womb? Do you know what she said? My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit does what? My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. What? How did that come into being? That happened in time because she realized this event is no ordinary moment. History... This is epoch making. History will take its reference point from all the things that are happening in my life right now. So if you can pick up with your spirit what I'm saying to you by the word of the Lord, I say to you, those things can be all of our experience. What's the prerequisite? Everyone say repent. repent. Say turn. Yeah. Right? Then it says times of repentance come from the presence of the Lord. I said to you whenever God's presence comes, it's to do purpose. Not so? Presence and, and purpose. And then times of uh, the heavens will retain, watch, will receive and retain Jesus until times of restitution. So the moment restitution happens, the heavens release the person and the presence of Jesus. What brings presence, what brings the person of Christ is the act of restitution. So restitution is like the pin code. The moment it is done, it releases the presence and the nearness of God. So we saw this in Zacchaeus' life. He came down from the tree, the Bible says, he gladly received Jesus. Symptomatic of receiving Jesus into his life. Jesus said, today I must stay at your home. Meno, abide permanently within your sphere. He went into the house, Jesus, they sat, and without being prompted, Zacchaeus said, if I have robbed anyone, I give him back four times the amount. Half of my goods I will give back to the poor. Only after Zacchaeus said that did Jesus say, Today salvation has come to your Salvation came to your person when you came down from the tree. You hugged me. Scripture says when he came down from the tree, he gladly received Jesus. 
But when they went into the house, and Zacchaeus said, I'm going to do something that gives evidence of my changed behavior. I will put the wrong that I've previously done, I will put the wrong right. I want to make restitution. Only when he did that did Jesus say, today salvation has come to your sphere. Everyone do this? It, it's not just you now, it's your whole house. Salvation has come to the house. Right? Remember Jesus is knocking Revelation 3.21 uh, on, on the door of the church at Laodicea. Right? I'm knocking if any man opens. It's not, that message is not to an unsaved unbeliever. Behold, I stand at your door and knock. If any man hears my voice, let him open. I will come in and he sup with him and he with me. This is not a message for the unsaved. That publicly is a message for the church. That was written to a church. And you know what Jesus said to that church? Repent and then overcome. Let me, let me quote it to you correctly. Okay. It's in your notes. Revelation, Revelation 3, uh, 19. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. It's on page 6. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Right? Who is this? This is not a message to an unbeliever. This is a message to a church. A whole church is commanded to repent. Right? Right? The whole church is commanded to repent. But what is the promise attendant with that repentance? Look at verse 21. He who overcomes. Watch. Now, if you overcome, that's times of refreshing. That's kairois. Kairoi. That's kairos. I don't know what the, the plural is. Right? That is uh, epoch-making periods and overcoming disposition. Now, watch. It says, he who overcomes, I will grant to him who sits with me on my throne. So if you repent with restitution and you overcome, this passage promises you a sitting on a throne. He who sits on a throne now governs, now has dominion, now exercises authority. But where did it all start? Jesus said to the church, repent, be zealous and, and repent. So this message on repentance is extremely Extremely important. Now, when you make restitution, you give evidence and you put on display the glory of God. You put on display the majesty of God. You put on display the fact that you are changed. Right? You give evidence of an internal process in you that now people can behold externally. You put the nature of God on display. To the one to whom restitution is made, the person now receiving, let's say, a restitutionary offering that you gave to them. The impact on them is marvelous because they see the grace of God in action in, in you. Particularly if it's an unbeliever and someone that does not know the Lord. And let's say maybe you hurt or you've injured or you offended and now you mend the relationship. And you make restitution to them. You know what that becomes? That becomes a, a platform for ministry. They get a view of God who is unseen, but now seen through you. They get a view of God that is seen in the most kindest, and you didn't have to do it, but you did it. Not out of necessity, but because you wanted to. And remember what it says, I spoke to you in the first session, how that God gives repentance. Repentance is given, therefore must, must be received. You gave something, let's say, and you restituted to some person. You're now giving it's, it's, it's what you've received, you're now in acting in the same. Okay? And let me just say this to you. You might feel you're unable to do it in your own strength. I said to you, the grace of God will empower you. The grace of God will fuel you to do what is necessary. Watch. So that after it's done, when the deed is seen, the grace of God is shown. Because grace prompted the act. When the deed, you must catch this in your spirit, when the deed is done, that is fueled by grace, when what is done to another and the other perceives it, receives, let's say, a tangible gift from you, the gift is not so much the issue that the person will have rec uh, recognition of as much as they will see in you the grace of God on display. Right? Uh, sometimes... Uh, 
someone, uh, some years back, someone gave us a significant gift. I was blessed by the gift and its magnitude, but my, my eyes and my conscience and my thinking went to what prompted this, this act. And my thanksgiving was for the gift, but more for the grace of God I saw behind the gift. Okay? It's what is behind the thing that prompts the thing that men will have recognition of. And then we looked at um, Jacob's example, remember? Jacob's example was quite significant because he defrauded a brother, Esau, out of his birthright. Even though he was firstborn, he didn't have to defraud the brother. He didn't have to resort to deceptive means to get what is noble. And I said to you, don't just go for what is noble without regard for how you get there. God is just as interested in how you get in getting and how you got there. It's not that you get, it's how you got there that God is very interested in. The nobility of an end is not justification to employ any means to get it. The end doesn't justify the, the means. Not because the thing is commendable, it's noble, what you're reaching for is, is, can be praised, therefore I must do anything to get there. No, God says, yes, reach out for that prize, but along the journey, don't violate any principle along the way. So yes, Jacob, what is his goal? Birthright, I want it. He's a heel grabber. That's how he was born, grabbing a heel. I want it, so I can do anything I want to violate principle in the process of getting it. What happened is, it, God pressed the pause button on his destiny for 20 years because of that. His brother was so angry, his brother wanted to kill him. Upon the advice of his mother, he ran to Haran to live with an uncle called Laban for 20 years. This is like a 20-year dislocation, 20-year inaccurate migration, 20-year inaccurate movement, 20-year in a foreign environment where purpose really can't take place. Now, listen carefully. Upon his return, because the Bible says he longed for his father's house. In 20 years, he longed for Papa's house. It's not that he wanted to be in Papa's precincts. The phrase longing for daddy's house literally implies a house is that place spiritually. I can't go to the details of this. The Hebrew word bayith for house is literally that place where purpose is enacted. Where destiny comes to Pass, right? Is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, you, your father is Isaac, Jacob. Your father is Isaac. Your grandpa is Abraham. You are now with Uncle Laban. <coughs> Uncle Laban cannot give you patriarchal succession. So you are dislocated. Now you must get back. What is the only factor prohibiting your reintegration to that domain. What's the only thing? A brother that you offended 20 years ago, who is now, whose anger hasn't abated with time. Not so? So he, okay, long story short, I need to get you to their study. Long story short, they reconciled, remember? And they wept bitterly on each other's, when they saw each other. After the day before he met his brother, he wrestled with the Lord all night top of the mountain. He saw the face of God. I will not let you go until you bless me. My father blessed me 20 years ago, but I, I got that fraudulently. Now I seek the same for myself legitimately. I will not let you go until you bless me. And so he gives a restitutionary offering after they connect. A, a, a whole lot of gifts he prepares, etc. And they connect. The men that Esau, the army rather, that Esau brought to kill Jacob, Esau now offers as personal bodyguard to Jacob. So what the enemy intended for evil, God turned around for his good. Times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. When a man who repents with restitution does it sincerely. Okay? Now, I was thinking... A verse, I added this new verse into the note, okay? And I just want to, um, to, to release it here quickly. It's not, it's not in your note, but uh, Genesis 28 and verse 15, if you want to write it down. 
Genesis 28 and verse 15. The Lord gave me this on Thursday morning. Listen carefully. I was thinking after the study on Wednesday. And um, I was in a meeting, and Joey Governor read this verse. It was almost like when he read the verse, I didn't hear for the next 15 minutes what he said. Because the Lord was processing this verse in me based upon what I just taught the Wednesday evening. The way, this verse says the following, watch. Behold, this is a word of God to Jacob. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Now that's an amazing and amazing verse. Listen to it carefully with your spirit. Just watch. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land, for behold, I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Now, I'm amazed at God. You know why? He just defrauded his brother the previous chapter. He's just tricking and conniving, and he robbed his brother out of his birthright. His brother is angry, and upon his mother's advice, he's now on the run to Haran. En route there, he stops to sleep. He has a vision of, an, of a ladder reaching heaven. Angels ascending and, and descending. The Lord promises him patriarchal promises similar to what was given to Abraham and Isaac. This is just one of them. Does God know he's on the run? Does God know? Yes or no? Is God aware the man messed up badly? Yes or no? Right? Does, is God aware this is a fraudster? Yes or no? Is God aware this is a conniver? Yes or no? Is God aware this man is full of niggy niggies and yaga nyagas? Yes or no? Yeah? Tell your neighbor, you too. Right? Now listen carefully. God is fully aware that the man presently has a deficient nature. He's nowhere near where he should be. Right? In fact, if anybody is going to threaten succession, it is Jacob. If you know Abram, if you know Isaac, now the baton and everything hangs on this guy. Right? I think God must be thinking, hey, sh did we make the right choice here? Abram, everything I did with you, Isaac, everything I did with you, hangs, everything's hanging on the balance of this guy's actions. Right? See, God must have taken a step back and think, hey, maybe we should have chosen somebody else. Hey, sh no, God doesn't do that. You know why? God knows the end from the beginning. God knows the end. Now, when, when, when Joey Governor read this verse, like I said, I, I couldn't hear but 10 minutes what he said afterwards. I had to quickly reorder my mind to focus on, on his sermon on Thursday morning. I'm thinking, and he, he shared powerfully on, on other matters, on the final finishing generation. And I came home and I processed this verse. I inserted this in here as a word of encouragement to this house. You know what the Lord said to me? And I'm saying it to this house as well. God knows that you're not where you should be. God knows that you might be deficient in many things. God knows that you're not up to scratch. God knows that. But don't use this as an excuse to stay there. Okay? Don't use this as an excuse to stay there. My, my thinking is this. You see all the powerful opportunities for repentance and restitution that Jacob made to Esau it would be 20 years later after God is saying these things. I want to read it to you for emphasis. What does God say to him? Listen, I am with you. Watch. I will keep you wherever you go, even for a season you might be dislocated. Even if it's going to be 20 years in an inaccurate spiritual environment, but don't worry, I will be with you. Right? Even though certain things cannot transpire in Uncle Laban's domain, I will never leave you. How many people are grateful for the mercy of God? He never leaves us, even in our wanderings. Early this morning, I was listening to a prayer prayed by Dr. Noel Woodroff on their recent worship CD. 
And he's thanking God for a whole lot of things. It moved my heart so much. And one of the things he thanked God for, he said, even in all my wanderings, you never forsook me, but you put me on a path of journey. I was wandering. If you read Noel's mind, he's saying, I was meandering without direction, but you took that and you put me on a path of journey with strategic and certain outcomes. Okay? Now, in Jacob's life, look at this. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you where? Wherever you go. And I will bring you back to? Everyone say this land. You're going to go away from this land for 20 years, but don't worry, I am going to bring you back. Tell someone you will be brought back. Some of you are taking longer than you should, but you will be brought back. Yeah? Some of you are dragging your feet, but you will be brought back, I say to you, by the Spirit of the Lord. Some of you are coasting, but you will be brought back. I am saying, why waste time? Because time is not what you have. He has time living in eternity. Your days are short on the earth. Why drag your time? You know, Jacob could have shortened the process. Right? But in the set time, he felt it necessary. You, you, do you know why? By the way, quickly. Do you know why he wanted to go back to daddy's house? Right? While working for Uncle Laban, Uncle Laban actually said to him, I've seen all the while that you were with me. All the while means 20 years. I've seen in 20 years that you were with me. You longed for your father's house. Longing for father's house is longing for purpose. Is to connect back to Abraham, Isaac, and patriarchal destiny. That's longing for daddy's house. The longing in Jacob's heart was not really to connect with an estranged brother. The longing in his heart is, I have birthright blessing by fraud. I know that I cannot enact it unless I connect to an accurate fathering grace. An uncle cannot father me, Uncle Laban, who himself is a trickster. By the way, what Jacob sowed, he reaped. Did not Uncle Laban trick him? Right? Not just with wages, with marrying the wrong wife. Right? Remember he worked seven years for Rachel? Who put Leah there? Laban. If you thought Jacob was bad, wait for Laban. What you sow, you will reap, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Right? It comes back to you. You know, one thing I've learned in life, everything comes back. Everything. You dishonor, guess what? Dishonor will come to you. You help, guess what? Dishonor or help will come to you. You withhold help, guess what? In the hour when you need it, help will be withheld from, from, from you. You lie, guess what? Be, be ready to become the victim of lies. Right? Tell your neighbor everything is coming back. Some of us say it, but we don't believe it. Because if you believe it, you will change your behavior. Amen? Everything is coming back. So what, Jacob, watch Jacob. Remember, uh, uh, oh, by the way, here's an important point. When he was in Uncle Laban's house, Laban said this to him, when he violently retorted, you tricked me, gave me the wrong daughter to marry. It's Rachel whom I love. Now, first of all, I want to ask him, how blind can you be? To consummate your marriage on the wedding night with the wrong lady. Right? It shows you how deception or, or, or a conniving spirit can blind your senses. Or maybe you are so in love, they say love is blind. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> how these things work themselves out. Right? But listen carefully. So Uncle Laban deceives him. So when he when he when he when he uh, uh, challenged Laban about the issue, Laban said this to him, did not you know the policy of the land? That it's not right for a man to give his second daughter first in marriage before the first is marriage. Right? So it's not good to have zeal without wisdom. Right? It's, it's, your zeal must be governed by principle. Right? Zeal must always govern principle. So you wanted to watch Jacob's heart, I'll need to go to daddy's house. 
And let me just say this to you. I'm, I'm seeing this much more now than I've ever seen before. The only prohibition barring his reintegration to daddy's house is an outstanding historical matter with a brother. Well, now, listen carefully. Time doesn't heal. That's a fallacy. Don't wait for time to heal. Sort it out. Okay? 20 years ago, Jake Esau's anger is far worse than what, than what it ever was. So what happens here? His connection with a brother, watch, gives him eligibility to do his father's business. The connection with a brother gives him eligibility to do his father's business. Many people say they love God. But Jesus says, how, how can you, John says, how can you say you love God whom you haven't seen, but you fail to love your brother whom you see? To do the father's business, you must engage brothers. A lot of offenses occur laterally, relationally, right? And, there's, and we need, after we've hurt people, you need to repent with restitution to sort the matter right. Even the Bible says, if you bring, who's got a gift for me? Oh, you typing on your cell phone. A gift. Okay, he has a gift. If you bring your gift, lovely gift. So most of you are wishing for this right now. <laughs> if you bring your gift to the altar, let's say that's the altar, watch. The Bible says, Matthew 5, when you bring your gift to the altar, suddenly you, what do you? Remember. Everyone say remember. remember. I want to engage the Father, but I remember something. Jacob Remember, 20 years ago, there's an outstanding matter, right? I remember that I've ought, let's say with Andy, I hurt Andy or anybody, I've ought against my brother. What must I do to this gift? Right? I must leave the gift here. It doesn't say take the gift with you, lest you have other ideas along the way, right? For the gift. Leave the gift, and what must I do first? The word first is used. What must I do first? What must I do? I must make right with my brother. And then the Bible says, must I, what must I do to the gift? Forget about the gift. You see, I must remember my brother, but don't forget about the gift too. <laughs> I must come back and then offer my, my gift to the, to the Lord. Watch. A gift to the Lord only has recognition and power with God when it's done from the context of ideal brotherly relationships. Some of you are sowing, and your sowing is not working. You know why? You're giving, 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 and sowing, but from the context of having hurt a whole lot of people, and nothing's working for you. Right? I would advise you, remember where you have fallen. Go back and pick up the exit, and then come and give your tithes, your offerings, and sow into the kingdom, and see what the Lord does. Amen? Jacob, I think these issues, although he wasn't in the New Testament... I think by the Holy Ghost, these issues are prompting his heart. I want daddy's house, but I need to connect with Esau first. Right? Now listen to me very carefully. You know, I'm not, this, this is unplanned. I have a separate teaching here regarding David, Abigail, two occasions of David's restitution. I think, listen carefully, I say this to you prophetically as a father over this house. I have gone through great pains to sort out things relationally with brothers. Some of the elders here know of a matter I've just done in the week, right? In, 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 in honoring somebody with 12,000 rand uh, of a matter we needed to do. Listen carefully. Why do I do things like that? It's not that I would just want to, for example, give money to somebody. No, no, no. That's not, that's not, not, not the issue. My issue is I want nothing in my world prohibiting my relationship with my father. Because I cannot love him without also loving my, my brothers. And so when you make restitution, please know this. Restitution is going to put you on a platform to do significant purposes of the Lord. Otherwise, the purposes of God will forever be on, on pause. Okay, And if you want things to rapidly move forward, you want things to rapidly move forward in your life. I know God spoke profoundly on Wednesday nights, but I would say to you, I think 
You, you must meditate on the word. One hearing won't do it. That's why we make recordings. You gotta, uh, I, I will encourage you, these notes that we hand out to you, uh, this should be your reading material in the week. You've got to read this uh, and process it again. You know why? We are moving fairly fast in this, this teaching. A lot of information is coming very, very quickly. Right? And what you could do, you could get lost in the volume of accumulating notes. Don't get lost. Don't be a good secretary. If I asked you where your notes, you see it, over here, come and see it's filed. But you say, your response will be, where's your notes? You must say, it's yeah. Come and see the changed life. Right? Come and see how this word has transformed my world. Okay? So I really want to, I really feel the impress of the Lord. Do not go past the place of not dealing with outstanding relational tensions. I say this to you. I don't know why the Lord has interrupted us like this. But I say this to you. Maybe from Wednesday when you heard me, you thought you could defer that one. The Lord says to you, don't defer it anymore. Act swiftly. For the longer you, 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 you protract, the longer you defer, the longer you defer the doings of my will in, in your life. Okay? This is very, very significant and extremely, extremely important. I want to just quickly look at another case study. Regarding Abigail, this is not in your notes. It will be in the second part of this note that I will share with you in the week. Everyone say Abigail. Abigail. The reference is 1 Samuel chapter 25. Now watch, watch this carefully. David was a fugitive from Saul. Saul was hounding him. Saul was chasing him. He's on the run. Okay. While on the hillside somewhere, he saw flocks, cattle, sheep are in quite significant number. Jacob, uh, David took it upon himself with 600 men that were with him to offer protection to all the herdsmen that were looking after the flock, the cattle, the sheep. Right? Just the, the Davidic heart of protection. So any thieves or fraudsters that would try to kill them or rob their, their livestock... He would use his skill in military uh, excellence together with his men and protect these individuals. And they did that for quite some time. So what happened after this is, he finds out that a gentleman by the name of Nabal is the owner of all of these flocks. A rich man, very wealthy man. Okay? So David and his men needed some refreshment, some replenishment. They were hungry. So he sent word via messengers to Nabal saying, why don't you please take care of our physical needs? 600 men, no, you can afford it. You're wealthy, extremely wealthy man. Just some basic things just for us to get by while we're on the run from King Saul. So this is how, when Nabal got the message, this is how he answers the messengers to tell David. He says, go tell this guy, who is David? I won't say what I think he said. <laughs> okay. Right? Who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? Then he makes the statement. Everybody these days are defecting from their masters to serve another. He's jibing at David for having defected from Saul's house. Right? He got no respect for David. So the, the messages tell the guy, but this man has protected us. He's looked after your assets. He spared your flocks from thieves and all sorts of things. Abigail, uh, Nabal says, no, I'm not. Definitely. Right? I'm not going to budge an inch. He's not getting one grain from me. So David gets the message, right? Now, how do you think David's going to react? Hey, the rage in David. When you read the account which you must read, David said, muster up the army. We'll now turn the tide. We leave 200 men, stay with the bags. He always did this, David. 400, let's go. And the Bible says his intent was to wipe out anybody associated with Nabal. Cattle, children, wives. It says nothing of Nabal's house will be had in remembrance. How dare he dishonor me in the way that he did. So the march is on. Like they go with him. And there's, a, there's this murderous intent in David's heart. You know, wipe you out, Nabal. Abigail, 
Nabal's wife, the wife of Abigail. The Bible says two things about her. Extremely beautiful. She was drop-dead gorgeous. Right? The Bible goes to great pains. You must read some of the other versions of the Bible that describe this woman. But the Bible also says, coupled with external beauty, she was a woman of great discernment. She had brains and beauty. It's good to have both in one package. <laughs> going to use the moment, brethren. <laughs> Amen. Right? So she has brains and beauty. So watch what happened. She hears that David is coming to wipe out everyone. And she quickly goes, she quickly goes ahead and listen carefully. I think I put it here in my notes. This is what she did. You'll find this in 1 Samuel 25 and verse 18. Abigail hurried and she took 200 loaves of bread, two jugs of wine, five sheep already prepared, five measures of roasted grain, a hundred clusters of raisins, 200 cakes of figs, and she loaded them on donkeys and she sent them ahead to David. So David is met. Excuse me. David is met with a gift from Abigail. She intercepts him before he arrives at Nabal's dwelling. Verse 23. When Abigail saw David, she hurried down. She dismounted from her donkey. She fell at, on her face before David. She bowed herself to the ground. She fell at his feet. And she said, watch what this discerning, beautiful woman says. On me alone, watch, my Lord, called him my Lord. On me alone, my Lord, be the blame. I know my husband's guilty. I'm taking, the, I'm bearing full uh, uh, consequences for that fool's actions. I call him a fool because she called him a fool. She said, this guy's a fool. But what does Nabal mean? Fool. The word Nabal means fool. She's saying, this guy got no brains. I'm thinking, why did you marry him? <laughs> okay. <laughs> She's thinking, you know, in the, in the Hebrew, it means senseless. She's saying to David, the man is a fool. Got no brains. Got no spiritual IQ. Got no spiritual discernment. Cannot see what you represent. And notice, I can't read the whole account to you. Let me just read a few verses here to get the, the gist in terms of how she said it. Watch. She said, please... Let your maidservant speak to you and listen to the words of your maidservant. Don't play with this girl. It's like she commands authority. <laughs> He's bowing before David and says, please listen, can I have an audience with you? And what, what she says, she fell, uh, uh, please do not let my Lord pay attention to this worthless man. He calls her husband a worthless man. Right? Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Verse 27, now let this gift which your maidservant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who accompany my Lord. Please forgive the transgression of your maidservant. Don't forgive the transgression of my husband. She's saying, I take this guilt upon myself now. Forgive me of this fool's actions. Forgive me and receive this gift. Now watch, there's two things here. There wasn't the gift first and then I'm sorry. Huh? Just like Jacob and Esau, Jacob first hugged Esau, then presented his gift. It's always repentance, then restitution. Zacchaeus came down from the tree connected with Christ. Then he said, half of my goods I give to the, I give to the poor. So restitution, listen to me, is not an attempt to bribe anybody. You don't think like this that I'm paying for what I d I've done either. Right? It's an expression of the heart that is manifest because of a sincere attitude of sorrow for what was done. Now, you know, when I read this, the Lord said to me, Randolph, and I'll, on, on Wednesday, you can't miss Wednesday because Wednesday will be very important. In fact, on Wednesday, I'll teach for about 40 minutes, the last two case studies. But I want to pray for about half an hour regarding healing our land 
and healing your land, your family, your sphere, your little world. Right? It's going to be powerful. So Abigail's restitution unlocks to her times of refreshing from the presence of the from the presence of the Lord. When David receives this gift, he praises her, he commends her, right? He jumps down, he, he tells all his men, let's turn back, take these gifts, and let's go back. Nabal's whole family and assets and wealth is spared by the restitutionary offering of one girl. One of you in your family can save your whole family. If you act strategically in a matter, you can save everybody, okay? Please, if you, if, you, if you regard me as your father in Christ and as one who speaks on, God, on God's behalf, I say this to you by the authority of the Scriptures. That if you're hearing what the Lord is saying to us today, one singular act of sincere and significant restitution, expressive of your repentance that you take on behalf, you might not be guilty yourself. You might be totally innocent. She said to David, I wasn't there when the young men came. For the, if I was there, it would be very different. Right? You might say, and let me just say this to you, there might be certain things happening within your family history, within your family line, within your family context. I believe that God today is authorizing you. I give you the keys to sort this matter out. Right? Now, on Wednesday, I'll prove to you that representational repentance is a valid thing. When you represent, representationally, to represent all other people. Right? I will show you, based upon the configurement in your heart, how widely you can represent. People like Ezra, Daniel, Nehemiah. You know, when these men stood before God, God told the whole nation. When these men said, I'm sorry, God said the whole nation is saying it based upon the, 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 the sincerity of one man. Okay? Tell you, remember, this is our hour. Right? Let me say, you're going to turn the tide on a whole lot of things. I say to you by the Spirit of the Lord, you're going to unlock epoch-making periods. Right? You know, I, I was extremely afraid to get married while we were courting. Nothing to do with Renee. It was the history I came from. It's like my forebears and my siblings, most of them were divorced and second, third marriages or second marriages, etc., and I thought, is this going to be my, my thing too? You know? And there was a little recitant in my heart, right? With my Abigail. <laughs> right? But you know, if it wasn't for the Lord, and let me just say this to you, a lot of healing has come in our family. And a lot of it has to do with our representation before the Lord. Okay? Zacchaeus' house. Everyone do this again? It's not just you, it's your... House today, salvation has come to your, has come to your sphere, has come to your, has come to your house. This can be your portion and more. Now, so Nabal is spared. That night, Abigail tells Nabal why David's intentions uh, are baited to kill him. He's still he's, he's feasting, he's drunk, he's merry with wine, etc. The Bible says this, that the Lord gave him a heart of stone, and he got ill. And after, I think it's seven days later, a week later or so, he dies. He dies by the hand of the Lord, not by the hand of David. You don't deal judgmentally with what God needs to deal with. Tell you never keep your hands clean. Right? I will not going to soil my hands. You know, David was prevented. I believe if David went ahead with this, you would have suffered certain consequences. I believe Abigail's interception was God's protection on, on David to prevent a host of things happening in, unsavory things happening in, in David's world. I say this to you by the Spirit of the Lord again. Please listen to me, church. Do not get personally involved with any kind of retributive action. Retribution is God's preserve. Vengeance is mine, declares the Lord. Vengeance belongs to me, declares the Lord. You know these scriptures? Okay. I'm saying keep your hands clean, but show kindness all the way. 
Nabal dies. The Bible says, news got to David's ears concerning Nabal's death. And he sends messengers with a note to Abigail. Won't you be my wife? Don't play with David. He chop. Right? <laughs> David knows, right? I mean, okay, David had an eye for beauty. Not so Bathsheba, Michael, uh, Ahinoam. What about Abishai? Well, David had about four or five wives in his history. He died at 70. He died young, relatively. He died at 70. He came to the throne at 30. He served as king for 40 years. Right? You know when the king died? What if you tell the story? I just laugh when I think of the story. Another time. This is another time. Let me tell you a little bit. When the king died, he was old and could not keep warm, the Bible says. His body was just, he just uh, very cold. No matter what the Bible says, clothing or blankets they put on the king, his men were very around his bed, couldn't keep him warm. And they sought for a young virgin, the Bible says, from the land of Shunem, the land of double rest. And they found, the Bible says, strikingly, message says, a strikingly beautiful girl, ravishing in her beauty. Abishad, and they brought her to David, and they, she lied. Uh, her business was to attend to him, all his needs. Uh, the Bible is very clear to say they had no sexual relationships. It says David did not know her. David did not cohabit with her, but she had to lie next to David because the only thing that can keep David warm is... <laughs> when they didn't respond, you didn't respond, they said, the king is dead. <laughs> David had this, uh... okay, let's leave that. So he says to Abigail, this particular weakness, okay? We, I mean, we know David, right? So David says to, Ab to Abigail, be my wife. You see, David knows that's the kind of girl I want next to me. Not just outwardly beautiful, intelligently discerning of spiritual realities in her person. Amen? Now, if you're sitting next to your wife, by faith, tell her, How's it, Abigail? <laughs> Hallelujah. May you all have an Abigail in the spirit. May your wife be to you an Abigail. Amen? Amen. Yeah, no one else is Abigail. <laughs> Hallelujah. But can, 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 you, can you sense what the spirit is saying? What did Abigail protect? Her own death. The death of everyone in her sphere. Not only does epoch-making periods visit this girl from serving a fool all her life, she now comes to serve David as his wife. Okay? She now occupies queen of the throne of Israel. Why? One act of restitution. One act of repentful, appropriate response. And let me just say this to you. I prophesy to all of you here today, don't look at your circumstances now and think, what has brought me to this place? I would, I would suggest go on a fast if there's nothing over that you need to correct. Sometimes there are things blocking things right, that you need simply release from. Okay. I remember it was about three or four years ago, the Lord laid upon my heart to, to bless um, somebody um, that I walked with very closely, and our relationship was estranged for many years. And the Lord said to me, so 20,000. A birthday was coming up that the person was had, and the Lord said to me, so 20,000 as a gift. And so, so the, I did an EFT, the person phoned me, he said, I'm taken aback by your, by your gift. I said, no, it's just a reflection of my heart, love you so much, you know, honor you in Christ, love you in the Lord, etc." That thing went a long way to healing relationships. Again, I'm not saying you're paying for stuff. This is not about paying for stuff. This is about reflecting the intent of your, the intent of your, of your heart. And I, I ask, you see Revelation 3.21? He who overcomes will sit with me on my? Did Abigail overcome? Yes. Where is she sitting? Her on her throne. You can go from, you can go. Let me say, brothers, you can go through a situation that is threatening welfare, threatening existence, threatening longevity, threatening prosperity. You can migrate quickly and be vaulted, catapulted, if you would, to the throne and sit 
now to govern issues on God's, on God's behalf. In Jesus' name. Everyone say, times of refreshing. Times of refreshing. Will come from the presence of the Lord. I can't tell you how I'm excited about this period. Every moment I wake up, my spirit is buoyant. My spirit is sensitive to the Lord. I'm saying, God, what will you do next? What's next on the cards for me and my family? What's next on the cards for this, for this household, Kate Ministries, Durban Central? I'm telling you by the Spirit of the Lord. Become an Abigail in the Spirit. Yeah? Save your household. Yeah? Epoch-making periods are now going to start in your life and in the life of this corporate environment. I believe that by faith. Lift up your hands to him. I hear the Lord saying, it's the powers in your hands. Powers in your hands to turn the tide. Salvation can come to your house. You can save, let me just say this, you can save your house from some foolish decisions that not you have made, others have made in the house. There are some fools sometimes in our existence, in our spheres. And you know, I, use, I, don't, I don't use the term derogatorily. It's not a fool as in deriding the person. Fool just means without spiritual IQ. No spiritual intelligence. So you act foolishly and you don't act wisely. May the Lord break forth upon every single one of you. I declare over you, church. I impart the grace to obey God. I impart the grace to repent for known sin, for sins that the Holy Ghost by His power will reveal to you. I impart that grace to you now in Jesus' name. I also impart the grace to you to obey God reflexively in matters for which you have to make restitution. May this portion be yours. May this experience be yours. I declare you and your house, you will serve the Lord. You and your house will not be lost. And when I say your house, it's not just your family. It's your workplace. It's your business. It's your sphere. It's your destiny. It's everything that's attendant with you will not be lost in the name of the Lord Jesus. I bless you, church with the peace of God that passes all human understanding. The Lord bless you today. The Lord keep you. The Lord cause His face to shine upon you. And the Lord give you His peace. The Lord take you from a situation that is life-threatening. And the Lord causes you to sit on the throne like Abigail. The Lord changes your context from that which threatens destiny. And the Lord causes you to sit on the throne today. The Lord causes you to govern today like you've never governed before. May the Lord authorize you in the Spirit to rule on His behalf because of your repentant heart, because of the disposition of your heart and your mind before Him as you obey His intent and His call upon you to make restitution. May the Lord's grace propel you. I declare now that today is epoch. It's epochal. It's epoch-making. I declare new kairos over the congregation. I declare new beginnings for many of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you know on the night that they came out of Egypt, they celebrated the Passover, remember? One night was all they had to prepare for. They celebrated the, the Passover at midnight, literally midnight. And the Bible says they, they left. Not so? Okay. One night. Everyone say one night. one night. One night broke 430 years of slavery. Moses is saying, we're out of this place. Amen. Everyone say one night. One night. You've heard of one night with the king? Yes. Sir. What about one night of restitution? <laughs> okay. That will unlock for you a whole range. Everyone say new season. You know what God said to them? This day. Say this day. Yes. Shall there be the beginning of months to you. God is saying, I know you've been governed by an Egyptian calendar for 430 years. But God is saying to the Israel, Happy New Year. Everybody happy. On the night of the Exodus was Happy New Year for Israel. God said, today is beginning of months. God instituted a new calendar. So tell you never, Happy New Year. You don't wait for 31st of December. I'm saying there's a brand new season. It's a brand new era awaiting you. Come on, tell a few people, say Happy New Year, by the way. Happy New Year. <laughs> tell someone, breathe again. 
Amen. Breathe again.